Right, people, let's talk all about Jordan 250K Ultra. This is essentially my post-race evaluation. We're gonna be talking about the good, bad, and ugly with all the preparation, what I would do differently now, having looked back, what I learned from the race, what I would be taking forward, and also as well, big tips and advice that I would give to people who are thinking about doing maybe their first ultra, maybe their first marathon, or maybe their first multi-stage and they don't know where to go. There's a little bit of a cool thing that you might be able to run with me. I'm just gonna leave it there. So you may be asking why have you left it essentially two weeks before actually talking about it? There's a really simple practical reason for me personally is that a lot happens. And then when you finish these races, there's a lot of euphoria, there's a lot of feeling of loss, there's an up and down move, there's so many questions of, is my body gonna be all right in a week? Is it gonna be broken? Is there gonna be any injuries? Is there any gonna be digestive discomfort? Am I gonna be crazily depressed on a very basic level? Um, and I needed to get all of that out and sorted before I could give you a full roundup. So in general, the body feels absolutely great. There was no specific injuries per se that came from the run. Um, I didn't end up completely covered in tape. I did get a little bit of tape on my mid back by one of the osteos one day because we established I was getting really bad thoracic pain um, after about 150K and I was like, this seems really strange because I don't normally get it. And it's because running in that kind of desert terrain, there's a lot of looking down and scanning the ground. And I'd essentially spent three days running like that looking for a nice route and a path to run through because when we're running in a desert scenario we're in the Wadi Rum Desert in Jordan essentially um, there's three different grades of sand or terrain that you're going to be working with it's all going to be sand based grade one gravel loose top pretty nice and runnable essentially um, grade two is a mixture of grade one and then deepest pockets of sand where you could fall and sink essentially for me that was my worst because you never really knew where you stood with it and you were constantly scanning like this following the flags and then disappearing off 20 meters one way to get some harder pack and then there was grade three which essentially was not really runnable it's what you would get on your usual beach really loose dune based sand very trudgy, would normally come up to the top of your trainers pretty much, not the fun stuff. So that was one of the things that you had to factor in was how to scan effectively. Um, so no other injuries, I didn't get covered in tape from the bottom half or anything like that. So very, very happy there. Mentally, yeah, I was exhausted. You know, you put four months into these preparations. There was also the change of it going from Mexico to Jordan and everything like that quite quickly. So mentally, I felt very, very tired. I felt pretty down for a couple of days in terms of that feeling of loss. You know, you've had something huge to focus on for a period of time. And then suddenly you're like, well, what do I do now? But then all in all, I came out of that other end feeling extremely proud of the performance. We got a sixth place or fifth male overall. We got a sub 30 hour finish, which gave me a, a white ribbon. And considering there was like 120, 130 people who lined up on the, on the start line, I was very, very happy with the race itself. So let's talk a little bit about the preparation. I've done a couple of little sound bites, um, but just in case people didn't really know, Obviously, I was originally training for Mexico. Mexico was gonna be a whole different beast to, to Jordan for a multitude of different reasons. But the biggest definable thing that was different was, one, it was gonna be at altitude. And two, it was gonna be around 12,000 meters of total elevation over the week. So uppy downy, uppy downy, opposed to being just trudging through and it was quite flat in Jordan. So talking about the altitude side of things, you may have seen a video where I went to train and do a lactate threshold test with the company, the Altitude Center. They essentially have a, a, a cabin which is set at different altitudes and they train with people all the way from the general population who do CrossFit, you might have um, a desk job and you wanna get in and you've got a short period of time and you want all of those adaptions from doing altitude training and that kind of stuff, all the way up to people who go and do seasons over in the Himalayas and they wanna acclimatize. So you've got the climatization side of things from doing altitude training, you've got the adaptability and more efficient oxygen delivery as such. Um, for want of a better phrase, I could have said that so much better. So when you do anything that is altitude related as well, one of the main things that you're trying to avoid is altitude sickness. And you don't necessarily know if it's going to affect you at what point and for how bad it's going to affect you. And I remember this from Kilimanjaro where it was like, 
don't know what's going to happen, maybe some mild headaches and that kind of stuff and a little bit of dizziness, all the way to we've got to get you off here because your pupils are being squashed and it's really, really bad. Um, this system was phenomenal and I essentially hired a system, I keep looking down because the box is right behind me, and had this system at home. So. I could essentially, for my low and slow runs, set the altitude or the oxygen concentration to be the same as what I would face at 3,000 meters and above, wear the mask, and then I would essentially, you know, had one of the uh, oximeters so I could see how much oxygen concentration was in my system. Um, and over time, that number would, or the percentage would grow a little bit, which then meant that when I was running at altitude, I was essentially performing and it wasn't stressing my body in the same way as it would if I hadn't, hadn't prepared for that. So you know what it's like when a lot of people, they do their off-season training at quite high altitude. So then when they come down to sea level, essentially, they feel like they're getting a rush of oxygen. There's so many different amazing processes that happen with altitude training. So don't think like I did naively when I first looked into it, that it was just anything to do with altitude. It's actually really good for general health performance. And a lot of people who do CrossFit, a lot of boxers and MMA fighters and all sorts use these in their training camps as well. So if you've got like a, a Tough Mudder or a marathon or something like that coming up and you wanna perform more effectively, it might be worth checking them out. So I'll put them below because they were wonderful. But we didn't end up having being able to use it in the way that I would have liked to because I didn't obviously go to Mexico. And then the other side, which I have been asked, I obviously took control of all of my strength and conditioning. Sam, my coach, took control of all of my run periodization because I like to just offhand that to a top level professional so I don't have to worry about it. I obviously do plenty of run coaching for a lot of my run specific clients now, and I am moving more into the ultra and multi-stage ultra world with my periodization as well, which is really, really exciting but it was an area that I didn't want to program long term until I'd walked the walk essentially because I feel like there's a lot that goes on up here that you have to have been through yourself to be able to coach someone effectively. So Sam took control of that and we got ready perfectly physiologically. I felt great, I felt excited, I hadn't done the total amount of distance I would have liked to, but you have to come to terms with the fact that the race changed very, very quickly and we had to be ready a month early. So all in all, that went really well. The other thing, when I think about my strength side of things, would I have done it any different if I wasn't doing Mexico in the first place? Realistically, no, because when it comes to strength training, unilateral strength, isometric work, slow eccentric work, plyometric work, compound lift strength, and also as well, a lot of what I call like reverse mechanics. So I did a lot of like incline reverse walks, that kind of stuff as well. Some of the stuff that gets really, really overlooked because we focus on what's happening when we're moving forward opposed to what's helping that braking system and mechanics and stopping our joints getting overworked. It's something that I really go into a lot more with some of my clients. Um, and that stuff was, in my opinion, what brought me home with no injuries, not covered in tape and all that kind of stuff. So training wise, it went absolutely perfect. I wouldn't, moving forward, I don't think I would change a thing from the periodization. I think the only thing that if I could is that I would have given myself that extra month to then be able to push that little bit harder at the end. We're talking about the nutrition side of things, the biggest thing that changed this time, obviously I didn't have Luke, my nutrition coach on, on board with this one because I think personally, once you've done one, you know your sweat rates and you've done the sweat testing, you've done VO2 max testing and all that kind of stuff. I'm a sports nutritionist, so I understand all of the stuff that he was giving me, but again, I wanted someone who was much more knowledgeable than me in that space to be able to nail it down and dial it in for me. Once you've done that once, you pretty much have a decent blueprint that you can just adapt based on where you're going to be and how long the race might be. So I took that system in and it worked absolutely perfectly. Um, I went off a very simple system of one liter of fluid per hour. Um, and then inside of that, you had your electrolytes. And then outside of that, I had one gel, which was around 24 to 27 grams of carbohydrates. I would also then have a biscuit or some nuts or whatever it may well be to add up to around 50 to 70 grams of carbohydrates-ish per hour. The thing that changed, this was fundamental for me and I don't think personally I will ever go back to the old system irrespective of the environmental factors that were considered, i.e. the heat, was 
I started having drinkable carbohydrates in this race. So what happened in day one and day two is that from around 30, 35K in, I really struggled with the palate ability of like granola bars and biscuits and that kind of stuff. So I found myself essentially not eating in that last third of the race and just depending on fuel as in electrolyte rich water and a couple of gels. And you're treading a fine line, even if you're used to gels, of having them a bit too much because they might go through a little too fast, right? So I had a conversation with one of the more experienced athletes in the field and he said, well, you have drinkable carbohydrates. Like I have like 50 grams before the run and then 50 grams at the end with protein. He's like, why don't you just have drinkable carbohydrates throughout the race? And I was like, that's a really good idea. So what I ended up doing, which is a really good tip for people is, in one of my 500 mLs, I had just electrolytes. In the other one, from zero to checkpoint one, which is like the first 8K, I had electrolytes and a double scoop of a carbohydrate powder, which was another 30 grams of carbs. And then every second checkpoint, I would then do that again. So it was a case of getting the carbohydrates in, for me, was a lot more effective through drinking them. And also they were sweeter later on as well, which when you're just getting really tired and hungry and that kind of feeling, that was, Honestly, I wouldn't have got to the end of that race, I don't think, in the way that I was doing it because getting 30 k okay into a day when you know you've got a 72K day coming and not really being able to eat for the second half of it, my body probably would have given out and I would have cramped and all sorts of stuff. No, no matter how many salt tabs I could have got in, it wouldn't have been enough. So always looking at your system as edible and drinkable and if there's a good collaborative approach would it be ideal for like two three four weeks at a time probably not i'd want to be getting more food in specifically um but for that period of time for me it probably saved my race so drinkable carbohydrates are a huge huge tip then the rest of the nutrition was just the same as last time we had dehydrated meals in the evening and in the morning the only things that i took out this time which i thought were like a wonderful little homey thing was Again, you know, you have these days and you're like, oh, I've got to run 50 or 60K. And no matter how you look at it, you always think you're going to be out on course all day. But with each of these days, you tend to be back, like in that leading kind of pack or the front third, you're back by like 1 p.m. So you've got all afternoon to kind of chill. So what I did this time was have like pot noodles and super noodles and stuff like that and cup of soup, which I could have as like a mid-afternoon light-ish kind of warm snack. And then I could have my meal in the evening, which obviously again, I had cappuccinos in sachets. I had hot chocolates in sachets. The stuff that I took last time, which you've, you've probably all heard about by now, which are nice little home comforts. So now the juicy one. What next? Okay, so you will know um, if you follow us on socials that John has been doing jujitsu for quite a long period of time now. I started just after my first 50, uh, 250k ultra uh, in Sri Lanka. I started in April doing jujitsu at my local academy, uh, the Tukan Academy, and I'm loving, like, absolutely loving it. I am so into it. I'm studying it, not just going to the classes and enjoying. I am literally nerding out, going away, following tutorials and trying to learn as much as I possibly can. There's going to be a huge emphasis training wise for me on jujitsu study over the next year, 100%, irrespective of where I'm living, how work is or whatever. There will always be an opportunity for me to study jujitsu, which I'm really excited for. In the running side of things, I'm actually going to be formally partnering with UltraX, I think. I say I think because I need to make sure that everything gets signed off and everything like that and everyone's happy. But I spoke to the race directors when I finished Jordan and haven't done two races with them. I love the team. I love them. They run a phenomenal race and they look after you and they're really, really good. And I just love the whole ecosystem was like, how do I integrate with those guys without essentially having to just run constantly back to back 250k ultras because realistically I can't do I don't want to do two or three 250s a year because it either means completely sacrificing every other element of my life and business um, to do these and prepare effectively or go in underprepared and risk injury which I'm not willing to do either so what I've come up with is an idea of being able to coach you guys and do the races together, which is really exciting because I had a couple of opportunities where I got to experience that, 
oh, I, I really helped this person. I really did something for that person. It felt really heartwarming during the race. So I know what I've got from my 250 experiences. There, you undeniably change and grow as a person. You, you, put, you pass through this doorway that you cannot go back through. And it's quite transformative. And I just thought to myself, I want to be able to be part of that for other people. So starting next year, I believe, I'm going to start doing training camps for, we're going to start with like either a 50 or one of the 110k races where they're like a two day race, where essentially I'm going to get discounted prices, hopefully, I'm hoping I can, for a select number of people who are gonna be on my team, right? And you guys will train with me, I will do all of your periodization, I will make sure that you're ready for your races, we will meet up beforehand and do some training together, and then essentially when we go out to these events, I will be there as dad, or big brother, whatever you want to call me, to help. We will talk about your strategies. I will run alongside you for the whole thing. I'm not going to be doing it as a competitor. I'm going to be doing it as a team captain. And I just want to be part of that experience and growth process for some of the guys and girls out there who are like nervous. Because I remember when I first signed up, I was terrified. So in terms of that, that's going to be the main focus moving forward with the ultras. I will do one, maybe two races next year. I'm totally undecided of exactly what that what they look like and where they might be um, because there's a lot going on in my my family life at the moment as well where we just need to figure out a few things and I don't want to turn around and suddenly dedicate to certain races and do this and then I can't do it and all the rest of it so I'm definitely the the, the, the final point is I will yes definitely be doing more multi stages maybe some 50 some more hundreds maybe even another 250 and that kind of stuff in the future hundred percent but my focus has shifted massively from it's all about me and doing these races to more about helping other people get over the line, which uh, I think, you know, when we think about passion and purpose, I think they're aligning quite beautifully. So I'm going to leave it there. I'm going to say thank you all so much for your support with these races. I've really enjoyed these journeys and there is plenty more exciting things to come in the future. Like I said, if you want to check out the Altitude System for or Center for any particular reason or your own training alone, or just being a nerd and finding out more, I'll put their link below. Also as well, any of the Ultra X races that you like the look of, I will put the link to their website specifically below because there's so many different races. And if you want to be coached by me for them specifically, just drop me an email to tlmonlinecoaching at gmail.com and I can have a conversation with you and jump on a consultation call about how that might look, how long we need to prep you for. And also as well, remember entry levels is essentially walking. You don't have to be a long distance runner to go and do an ultra. You could be someone who sits at a desk job, doesn't even really run right now. I promise you, I will get you ready. All right. So do not feel like there's an entry level to play. And then finally, if you're excited about potentially coming and doing one of these races with me, let me know in the comments section below because it's going to be happening next year. So if it gets you tingling, a little bit nervous, a little bit excited, a little bit apprehensive, I think you'll enjoy it. So thanks so much, guys. I'll see you in the next one.